what is higher risk really than needing an organ and not getting one? Hey folks, welcome to Transplant Helper again today. My name is Jim Merle and today I just want to kind of sit down and talk with you for just a few moments about some of the changes that I feel like really needs to occur and needs to happen in the transplant community and especially in the society that we live in, especially here in the United States, concerning organ donation. You know as well as I do that there are not nearly enough organs being donated in order to fill the need of all the people who are listed and awaiting organ transplant. For example, there are more than 223 some odd thousand people right now as I speak who are currently listed for organ transplant who may or may not be able to receive that. There are more than 21 to 23, depending on your statistics, who are dying every single day as a result of not receiving the gift of life. And so there's an imbalance there between the need that is out there and the available organs that are there right now. And so there has to be some changes that are coming up, some advancements, some progress being made if we're going to be able to make those organs available and potentially save lives like mine has been saved and like many of you who are watching this program you've already had your life saved by organ donation and so i just want to talk about that a little bit today but before i jump into that let me just be honest with you as to why this comes to mind today as much as it has and it really comes to mind because of several cases recently but especially one that i learned of today where a good friend of mine Eda Kaysen, actually from Atlanta, Georgia area, at least was in the hospital over at Emory in Atlanta, passed away several months ago as a result of not receiving the heart transplant that she needed. And I, and I just found out about that today. One of her uh, children, I think her daughter, contacted me and let me know about that. And I regret it. Uh, that actually occurred back in May, and I, I just now learned of it. But it kind of, you know, it just kind of hit me right where it hurts because it's another one of the names that are added to my mind, uh, in the back of my mind, that I really thought they, they would do it. I really thought that the organ would come through. And in spite of their situation and the way that it seemed to be going, I really thought the availability was going to be there. And for Ed Kaysen and so many others, William Campbell still comes to mind. He's fresh. Just a number of people. It's regrettable and, and you know, just sad that those things never occurred. The, the organs weren't there. And so, you know, they did not win this battle in this side of life. And so what can we do? What are some of the things that we need to be talking about, not just among ourselves, but talking about, you know, with our government, with the, with the society and the public, those on the outside that are going to make these organs available. And I think first and foremost, we, we cannot overlook the fact we really need more being done to raise awareness of the need for organ donation in our country. Now, I'm not, I'm not talking about everything that's being done. I'm talking about some of the things that could be done better. For example, uh, our media, uh, the, the network news, that sort of thing, advertisements on television, radio, uh, pop-ups on the internet as much as we hate that. I really wish that could be made better. I really wish it could be more aggressive advertisement put into place to make sure that people are aware of the need for organ donation and how to go about doing that and how just important, life-changing, life-advancing, life-giving that organ donation is. And so raising awareness, you know, in the media is one of those places where we're doing better than we did, say, five, six, even 10 years ago, but we're still not doing enough. You know, I'm seeing more commercials for vehicle advertisements, cell phone companies, Companies, you know, uh, alcoholic beverages, you name it, every other type of advertisement that you see on television is much more prominent than someone possibly giving the gift of life. And, and I know that, you know, uh, I understand why that is. There's more money for that and to do an organ donation commercial might be more voluntary on a network's part or whatever, but still, this needs to be done, okay? And we've got to be sure that our government as well as the media is aware that we want this to be there. We want this to, to be made available and the people become aware. Now, in addition to that, and this is where I'm looking at myself kind of in a proverbial mirror. There's actually one right behind me I could go look in. But I'm saying to myself, Jim, and, and I'm saying to you, we need to do more personally to make sure that we're doing all that we can to raise awareness about organ donation, starting with our families, 
our friends, our coworkers, our classmates, and then getting involved with our local OPOs, our organ procurement organizations, you know, uh, Donate Life Americas per state, you know, per whatever, and being sure that we become ambassadors for those groups and that we're spending some time, you know, taking a Saturday or, or whenever that comes available and getting out there and getting behind those tables ourselves physically and, you know, in the malls or wherever these things are coming up and, and sitting down and telling people face to face how important it is, even strangers, how important it is through advertisement of ourselves to give the gift of life. And you and I as transplant recipients, those of us who are, uh, we are the best ones to do that, okay? They can hear it from anybody and everybody else, but have someone sitting in front of them and saying, I have, have life, I have a chance, I have opportunity because of the gift of life, why that cannot be outdone, okay? So make sure that you're doing your best as far as raising awareness. Number two, make sure that once that awareness is made, that we're all making those personal decisions to register to become the organ donor. It's not enough just to know that organ donation is important if we don't do anything with it. So many things in life we're aware of, we understand, we kind of get it, but if we don't take action and if the people around us are not taking action to literally register, whether it's online, whether it's in, you know, in print, whether it's down at the local DMVs or whatever, if we're not actually registering to become those organ donors, then, you know, it could be that as much as we want it and as much as we think it's a good idea that uh, we're never able to actually do that. And of course, letting your family and your friends know about your decision, so important and we need to be doing that. So uh, making awareness more available out there and actually doing something with that. If you're watching this program and you're not uh, a transplant recipient, uh, but you're also not a registered organ donor, register right now. This is your time. This is your chance. I'm making a challenge. Please go out and do that right now. And then in third place, uh, we really need to be thinking about, again, and I've already had an entire program on this. I'll link it up here in the corners. I'll try to put it in the description below a link to it. We need to be thinking through, again, the possibility that's been around for a while of whether or not we as a society need to go from the opt-in to the opt-out uh, form of organ donation or registration for organ donation. Now, an opt-in, that's where we are now. That's where unless... A person makes a voluntary effort, and it is an effort, to register in any of those ways to become an organ donor. That's the only way they're going to become an organ donor. they got to register and make a choice to do it. On an opt-out system that basically says that everybody in the United States who's a citizen is immediately and already from birth, basically, an opted uh already opted in, and therefore the only thing they can do if they desire is to opt out. And so you're an organ donor unless you, for whatever reason, decide, I don't want to be an organ donor. Then you make the effort to get out of the system and opt out of that. And I know there's a lot of opinion out there about that. I hope you'll go back and watch that previous video just to think it through with me a little more in depth. But the opt-in, opt-out situation is something that's being tried in different countries around the world. And maybe we as the United States of America need to consider uh, moving from one system to the other, at least testing the waters, seeing how that'll work. I think that will raise the number of organ donors because it will raise the number of people who are, you know, listed to potentially donate. Uh, and again, still free will involved. A person could still decide, I don't want to do this and they could make that choice. But, you know, it's just a, a matter of opinion, maybe, but I think that would help. So let's talk about that. Let's consider that. And let's, let's make sure that we get the facts on the opt-in versus the opt-out situations and try to decide if that's something we may or may not need to try as a society. Now, in the next place, maybe this is number four on the list. Uh, we really need to be getting more educated and aware on a couple of different facets of this about what a high-risk organ is. And again, I've had entire programs about receiving high-risk organs or, 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 or trans, being transplanted from a high-risk donor is really what it is. Um, we really need to think that through because what, what makes a high-risk organ, again, that program 
expands on this, but what makes a high-risk organ is not always really high risk. You know, someone who's been to jail, maybe spent a few nights in a jail or been to prison, you know, for any period of time, those people, for example, are automatically considered high risk, regardless of whether or not they've really lived a risky lifestyle, regardless of if they've ever been involved in any risky activity. They may be disease-free, uh, clean, clear, and healthy, but because of the night they spend in jail, they're automatically high risk. And so what happens is on this side of that, we're laying in hospital beds as potential transplant patients. Doctors walk in and say, well, we've got an organ available for you, but it's high risk. And we get apprehensive. And I'll admit to you, back when I was going through the transplant process personally, I didn't want the high risk organ. You know, I actually told them I did not want that. And I was at a point then as far as how sick I was that I could make a choice and I could opt away from the high risk organ. And lo and behold, as it, as it worked out by the blessing and, uh, you know, grace of God, I received an organ that was not high risk, but I really cut my pool down uh, as far as potential donors when I refused at the time high risk. And I think looking at it now, especially as there's been advancements made concerning certain diseases, for example, hepatitis C, five, 10 years ago, hepatitis C was, you know, just a terrible curse that could come upon someone. And you certainly didn't want as an organ recipient to, to get hepatitis C from your donor if they happen to have that. But now that it's become much more treatable and even in some cases curable, uh, it's not as big a deal. So, you know, now I think I could accept a higher risk organ, you know, and be emotionally ready for that. And if that organ, you know, was a hepatitis C, C positive, just for example, you know, I would know that that can be treated. And I think there needs to be more awareness on our side. And I, that would definitely increase the pool of potential organs we would be willing to accept. I think on the other side of that, our physicians, our teams, uh, the people who are coming in our room and telling us that we have an organ available or, or whatever, uh, they need to be more, be more aware and maybe more open-minded to transplanting higher risk organs sometimes because, you know, what, what is higher risk really than needing an organ and not getting one? And you think about that. I'm five and a half years post-transplant. If May the 23rd, 2013, which is the day I received my transplant, if I had not gotten that, would it be higher risk to not get an organ at all or to accept an organ that, you know, maybe could potentially cause me some problem later? Eh. You know, our physicians need to be really working on that. There are a lot of transplant centers out there, and I appreciate, I really appreciate the caution of our teams, our physicians, you know, our surgeons, that making sure they're giving us the best chance, the best foot forward, the best potential organs. But there needs to be a little bit of open-mindedness on the, on the part of our physicians to say, you know what, uh, this may not be the optimal organ, but it is definitely doable. And, and maybe making a, a few more concessions on that and not waiting around always for total perfection uh, before they offer those organs. And there are some teams out there that won't do it. They want their numbers to remain high. They want their survival rates to be perfect or as best they can. They want to be known around the country for having a, you know, a 98% survival rate. But the, one of the ways they're kind of achieving that sometimes is because they're not taking high-risk patients and they're not taking high-risk organs. And so, of course, your survival rates may look better on that, but they're not doing as much to save lives. So considering high-risk organs, considering the possibilities, you know, out there of uh, offering those as a physician or as a patient, considering whether or not we uh, should be willing to personally take advantage of those. And then here's the next one here, maybe the last one we'll talk about today. I guess it's going to be number five now. Um, thinking about exactly what the pool of organs would really look like if a few changes were made. On the one case, as they're beginning to learn that older and older people can donate viable organs, uh, that could really change the face of things and increase the pool. You know, there used to be a, a number out there that hung over our heads like a, 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 I wouldn't call it a glass ceiling, it was more like an iron ceiling, which could key if you hit it, you know where they said, number one, if, if you're over 65, you can't get an organ. Number two, if you're over 65, you can't donate an organ. Uh, 
Well, they've raised the ceiling in some places. UAB Hospital, where I was transplanted now, has done a ton of transplants, experimental type things, where they've given organs to people 65, 70, 75 years old, and they've seen them do very well. So they've kind of raised that ceiling and made that easier. But some of those same transplant centers are not willing to take donations from people who are older. And so, you know, a lot of people are living to be older and older, and maybe they're getting themselves in situations where they would become ideal and willing donors. But, you know, a doctor comes in and says, I know uh, so-and-so, she's, she's 67, so we can't use her organs. Well, there's actually been some documented cases where people as, as old as 72, 73 have donated organs and had very successful recipients come from that. So uh, raising and, and expanding the pool because of the age range and the potential for older and older Americans to donate would make a difference at the same time. And this is probably something you don't know. This is still under number five, but right now, currently in most states, and let me clarify, I said most states, some states are not acting this way, but in most states, unless a physician signs off on a person and says they are brain dead. And I hate that term. It's, it's regrettable. It's, it's descriptive, but um, that they lack brain activity. Unless a physician says there's no brain activity, the OPOs or organ procurement organizations cannot even come in the room and talk with the families. So what's happening is there are people out there who, whether it be because of stroke or blood clot or injury, who are, you know, their, their life is pretty much gone out of them. There's no activity. There's no hope. Sometimes the physicians know that. The families know that. And even I know of cases where the families have started to talk among themselves. You know, what if we donated his or her organs? You know, is that something we can, we can consider doing? But the truth is, in many states, the OPOs cannot even have that conversation unless the doctor specifically wrote on a, on a document, this person is brain dead. Or this person has no brain activity. Unless a doctor signs that, the OPOs can't even walk in the room. Okay, and I get why that is. I get privacy. I get, you know, not wanting to come across as pushy, pressuring families. I'm totally for protecting you know, these families in these most trying, difficult times. But at the same time, you know, if, if the doctor knows this, the family are even aware of this, why does it take a specific diagnosis and specific signature for the LPOs to be able to come in and do the job that they do? Which is in 99.999% of cases that I've known of, where they come in with much concern, much love, much care, much compassion, and they just sit down and they give out a few brochures and they talk with families and say, look, you know, if, if you wanted to think about this and just think about it, it's your decision. What do you think about your loved one, you know, if things don't change, donating uh, their organs or donating, you know, something that can help someone else? And that's the conversation they're trying to have. But the truth is, in some cases, not all, but in most cases, really, OPOs can't even have that discussion. And so I don't know how that needs to change. I don't know if the physicians need to be more clear and defined, you know, when they're signing off on whatever it is they have to sign off on or not, or whether it needs to be a discussion that's had with the families. And in the case that I'm thinking of, actually one of the wives contacted me and I knew her husband's situation. It was, you know, terrible what had to come. And the decision she was having to make, and she contacted me and she said, Jim, I would love to donate his organs, what do I need to do? And I said, well, what will happen is you need to tell so-and-so and they'll send out the OPO. And, you know, I told her all about the conversation I thought was going to happen, but it didn't happen. Um, the doctors never suggested organ donation. OPOs never came in. He ended up passing away and the organs were not donated. And, you know, I, I, I wondered why, and I didn't ask, I didn't want to ask, but I found out a little bit later from the wife again that they never gave me the option and found out the doctor had never really signed off on the lack of brain activity. So from what I know from the other side, the OPO, at least in our state, could not go in and talk. 
How do you change that? I'm not sure. But anyway, let me remind you of these things, making sure that there's more awareness available out there. We need to do our job for that. There are actual registered organ donors, not just people who say what they want to do, but actually go through with it. There needs to be a consideration of the opt-in versus opt-out that we might be involved in one day. Consideration and understanding of higher risk organs on the patient and the, and the physician's part. And then, you know, consider opening the pool up with age range, you know, making sure that those people who are available to donate organs are given, the families at least, are given those opportunities. I hate that we even have to have this discussion, but we're about to turn a new year here. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, this is New Year's Eve right now and going into 2019 and on in the future. And we really, we really need uh, a better donor pool out there so that we can have the gift of life. And I really want to encourage people to please give the gift of life. I appreciate you joining me today. Please, if you've got any, any suggestion, any uh, thing that you can offer to the discussion, please be willing to comment below. Give your ideas, your suggestions, uh, suggest ways that we can go about getting some of these things at least looked into because we got to work together. We've got to work together as a transplant community to make sure that more and more lives are being saved. Thank you so much for joining me today. And until next time, please stay stronger, friends.